Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we start, we have a few basic housekeeping items. We want to bring to your attention an important update regarding the conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions, D, F, and H on the initial schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box and we will endeavor to answer these questions at the end of the presentation. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag G-A-D-M-C-O-N-F in your posts about the conference on social media to help us spread the word. A short evaluation will be made available when you exit the session. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GADMC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year after it has been properly edited. It is our great privilege to have with us today Dr. Jackson Z from our platinum sponsor organization, Four Paws International, where he currently serves as the Director of Global Affairs and Disaster Resilience. Without further ado, I turn the microphone over to him and his presentation on championing animal disaster law at an international level. Welcome, Dr. Z. Thank you so much. I'm um, very happy to be here today. Um, so let me just begin. So um, I know there are people are from all over the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my, my presentation today will be called um, Championing Animal Disaster Law at the International Level. Um, so I'm Jackson Z. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And I work um, in both policy and in uh, disaster response um, for all kinds of animals. Um, currently, I'm working for a group called Four Paws International. Um, they're based in Vienna, Austria. They have about 14 country offices around the world and 18 projects offices globally. Um, the information is there. So I've been working in this industry um, with many amazing mentors and friends and colleagues for um, about 30 years now. Um, and I know that I'm still learning. So um, today's presentation will be a bit generic and a bit general because it's an overview, um, but it opens the door for any questions about any specifics or how it's applied. And I hope that helps. So um, just a quick overview, right? Um, we're gonna talk about the impact of disasters on animals. Is there an impact? Um, what is the current state of animal disaster legislation on a national level or even on a regional level? There is, a, is there a need for international collaboration? Um, and what does that mean? And what are the constructs existing out there about it? Um, there are some basic principles on how we do that. And we're gonna talk about what's the way forward. So disasters, whether they are um, man-made or um, they are what we term natural, um, some people are offended by the word natural disasters, since uh, most disasters are unfortunately are no longer able to be considered natural since they don't exist unless people are impacting it. Um, disasters affect both people and animals. Um, so it's the entire community of living beings. Um, whether they are 
wildlife or livestock, farm animals or companion animals or pets or you know whatever kind, um, they're all affected by these different kinds of hazards. <laughs> and during these hazards, um, they are injured, they are separated, um, and unfortunately, some of them even pass away. So recognizing the needs is, of course, a very important part of disaster or emergency management, the management system that takes care of both people and animals. So currently, some countries have laws that protect animals during disasters. Um, but it is definitely not uniform. Um, there are generally disaster laws for people and communities, but it did not, many neglect the inclusion of animals at the moment um, on a global scale. You might be from a country where it is included, but then in some places it's only livestock or in other places it's all animals, but the execution is a little bit funny or wonky, um, not integrated. So animals are not an added value to current disaster legislation, but really it needs to be part, part and parcel of the whole package since all living things have the potential to suffer and perish in the disaster. So these inconsistencies make our work in response very, very difficult. Um, and it also doesn't meet the legal requirement when one country has laws that protect animals, but when they ask for help from a neighboring country, that that level of service isn't provided since another country, the next country that they're asking may not have it in their laws. So animals are no longer served since the training isn't there. But we need global cooperation to include animals in disasters so that no animals left behind. So animal welfare is the priority. Um, we believe that animal welfare is very much and critically linked to human well-being. And that to achieve this, the collaboration across countries is absolutely necessary. Um, so we as advocates and need to speak with policymakers, um, with the ministries that are responsible at both the national and the subnational level, um, as well as organizations like Four Paws or many other wonderful ones um, that go out and respond on behalf and with local jurisdictions. Um, this provides the best services forward for animals and their owners. Um, and this needs to trans transcend the boundaries since everything is you know, national, um, that it makes it quite challenging. Um, and then we can learn best practices and share those best practices so that we can learn from each other. But by doing the sharing, we should be able to have the better outcome for animals. At least that's our hope, right? And that's why we have wonderful conferences like the GATMAC to allow us to share our knowledge and our understanding of the current status of emergency management disaster response for animals and for people. So some basic principles about animal disaster law or championing it, it needs to be inclusive. Um, and that means people too. So all kinds of economic status, um, many times when we work in other places, other countries, we see that um, the poorest of the poor of a community have animals um, that need to be take care of, taken care of. But if they, them, those people themselves aren't getting the services, Neither are those animals. Um, and for things to be, uh, when animal, how do I phrase this? <laughs> when we wish to provide the best services and bring the best animal welfare, it needs to be on par with what people need. You can't help a farmer by giving the animals everything 
but the farmer himself may not be able to survive. Um, does it have water, shelter, food, the basics? Um, so we need to make sure that it's equitable for both the animal owners and the animals. Preparedness, ooh, keyword. So many countries have developed a comprehensive disaster plan and many countries should develop a comprehensive disaster plan. And all countries need to review their disaster plans and update them regularly so that they are more inclusive, so that they are also better prepared. Ultimately, when we speak about evacuation, it's a, do I stay or do I go? And when, the timing is the key there. If as an individual, so with those services that we need to plan and provide from emergency management, then it's a, how many people, how many animals, where and what. So what kind of animals, where can we house them? The authorities need to be integrated if you are doing this independently. However, it should truly be led by authorities. If they aren't, we can advise them and assist them in their remit to meet the demands of emergency management through their specific silo and government, be it the veterinary authority or the Ministry of Environment. Um, we help them directly and indirectly under their joint emergency management system. Um, and that is one of the interesting discussions that are happening in the US. A joint emergency management system means that you're no longer siloed into having your own budget to do your own thing, but coming under the disaster system, which forces us all to report properly um, and follow a chain of command that allows for better transparency um, and hopefully more effective rescue of people and animals um, and a better response to that. <clears throat> First responder training. <clears throat> now we get this a lot um, where um, people want to help and they want to know what should I train for to achieve what I want to do. The question is, what is it that you want to do? And the best way to find out is your national plans on what is currently the standard for human emergency management or technical rescue. Um, and there are standards for every country. Um, you need to follow those rules for that specific country. When you go to a different country, they may have different rules with different criteria. Um, and those credentials need to be presented, but you need to come in as a team, not as an individual to be able to respond. This is one of the challenges that um, we will speak about, um, I believe tomorrow, about um, convergent volunteers. But those trainings that are given are human, human centric and human based. Um, and they may or may not have animal handling, but those are the questions that we can pose in advance to ask in a situation where you have to deal with an animal, what kind of training should you get? Um, and then it might be very fragmented. So standardization of training is very, very important and it can be encapsulated under the animal disaster law on a national basis, but then it also needs to be uniform so that reciprocity can be recognized at a regional and international level. Public awareness, of course, is really, how do we tell this to the general public? Um, preparedness is key. How prepared are the public in terms of knowing the season of disasters? Are they on alert to know when the warning systems are turned on, that they are keeping their ears keen on those kinds of information. Um, are they, unfortunately, sometimes lackadaisical, waiting? Um, these are the things that we have to improve through communications channels, working with media, government, um, just to be able to convey, one, it's the importance. It's not to incite fear, so it's not about the danger, but about in case this happens, what should you do? Um, and there's many, many um, preparedness opportunity uh, trainings and opportunities out there that could be leveraged through better public awareness. 
Collaboration, of course, is if you are working in emergency management as a government employee um, or, or working in a veterinary authority or other kind of government system, um, partnering with animal welfare organizations, animal protection organizations can really help because one of the challenges we hear a lot from the veterinary authority is they may not have the capacity. They know what's going on, um, but it may not be their specialty either. So it relies on multiple actors on the ground. That means the emergency management, which is a government authority that manages the response for a disaster. The ministries that take care of animals, be it the veterinary authority, the ministry of environment, um, and it depends on what country you're in. It might have many, many different organizations um, to work with animal protection organizations um, to help fill the gap, get the training to do the right thing so that we can collaborate at the most efficient level for a quick, speedy response to get everybody to recovery as quickly as we can. So, we talked a lot about sort of, you know, hey, there's a need for this. If your country doesn't have animals included in their disaster legislation, please advocate for it. Um, there are many examples. You're welcome to come back to me. I have many wonderful examples um, to see which one fits. Those legislations should not be just for a particular type of animal. It needs to be all inclusive because we will lose the momentum and the management of the different types of animals may unfortunately not be as holistic because is a horse a pet? Is a horse a farm animal? Is a horse you know, a wild animal or animal that has been running around free? Um, it becomes complex because we categorize animals in a different way. Hence, it's important to include all animals so that every situation that comes up that we know of now may change in the future, that it's adaptive and we're able to address it under a holistic frame. Um, to do this um, on the national level, it's by showing the need. Um, and you can show the economics of being proactive in the preparedness and in helping to save animals, it can also show that it reduces human death um, when owners of animals run back into burning buildings or running into floodwaters. Um, it becomes very dangerous for themselves, their animals, um, and it's a, also very challenging for emergency or technical responders who then may have to go and rescue all of them. So it's a drain on resources and just a danger. Um, but happy to explain more about this. So we encourage more academic research that shows it and wonderful people like Mail Teller um, from Griffith, Griffith University um, in, um, I'm sorry, McCory University in Sydney um, has done some wonderful work on the social science basis on the response, of, uh, the reaction of first responders when um, animals or people who own animals um, become endangered. So um, let me see. What you should know is um, the way forward is that there is a piece of legislation. It's from the United Nations Department of Disaster Risk Reduction. It's called the Sendai Framework. Sendai is a place in Japan where they drafted this framework. Um, in that framework, um, some animal welfare organizations have come together and put in into the framework that animals need to be included. We're trying to expand that definition um, because right now it says that animals that are productive. And that could be interpreted in many, many different ways. And we try to expand that so that all animals are included. And at least in spirit, many signatory states, member states are signers of that. It's simply the 
actual practical implementation is a challenge within the current frames. So um, that's one of those case studies. Um, right now in Europe, we know that um, there's been discussions about having a regional EU law. Um, the challenge is one country has already implemented animal disaster law, all animals, and that's Italy. Italy is commonly threatened with various hazards from volcanoes to earthquakes to fires um, to floods. And the challenge there is when they request for assistance from neighboring countries through the EU um, Union Protection Mechanism, which is the cross-boundary or cross-border assistance, um, the other, or the other countries may or may not have animals in their training or as a priority. So when they respond and assist the Italian responders, they're not looking for the same things. And what happens is that there's an inequitable delivery of services that becomes a challenge. Um, we see this also in places like India, Mongolia, where livestock, is included in the disaster law, but no other animals. And that becomes disproportionate in the kind of services that are provided at the level that needs provided. Um, as we also see that it becomes a One Health or One Welfare challenge. So One Health is an inclusive health component that looks at human health, animal health, and the environment. Um, and the secondary issues are really One Welfare, where we see that when an elderly person might lose their pet, may not think much of it, um, but they become more susceptible to depression um, when they've lost an animal in a disaster. That, that animal might be their link, um, the thing that they take care of um, if their children have grown up and moved away. So in doing so, we find some challenges there that if you include the animals in your response, um, you actually help people, not just in their physical health, but also can help them in their mental health. <clears throat> and we're looking into that right now with the Danish Red Cross um, into psychosocial first aid. Um, there's many case studies that I won't go into right now, but just know that there are these links um, and they do exist and that people and animals are definitely interlinked in both their well-being and welfare. So the call to action is if you are an emerging management practitioner, please work with your government authorities that manage animals, like the veterinary authority, the environmental ministry, don't forget agriculture, industry, wildlife, include them in your work, in your preparedness planning, in your messaging. So the community knows and they'll feel and see that everybody's taking action. If you're an animal welfare, um, animal protection worker or supporter, and you wanna help animals in disasters, please work with an organization that works with the authorities, has proper safety trainings, and actually has appropriate levels of safety and care. So going into um, floodwaters, just know that the water is toxic, hazardous, dangerous, you need to have special equipment, you need to have special training. I know it's just a dog and it's just right there, but the dog when it comes out still needs to be decontaminated and cared for in the right way. We don't know what's in the water, potentially after a flood, there's many, many chemicals and they can be um, longer lasting than we understand. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is um, cracking a little bit. Everyone who's here today, Please engage with your government policymakers to have a more robust animal disaster law in your country on a national level and how they participate on a regional level. So I'm going to say this again. You need it on a national level. You need it on the regional level. Um, it's important to share your knowledge and best practices so that we can all learn and share. Um, an extra footnote for me is when we talk about people who care and they really just want to jump and go, um, we have that situation right now um, or have been in Greece with the recent fires where people have been calling to action saying, come and help. 
The question is, what are they coming to do? Are they trained in wildfires? Are they potentially going to be heat exhausted and tax on and be a burden on local health services because they didn't drink enough because they care so much? Um, it becomes problematic or challenging for local authorities to manage um, all this extra help that isn't under a incident command. So please understand, it's not that people don't want the help, they want the, the right kind of help at the right time in the right place, and that just needs to be managed. Um, and we need that both on a national and a regional so that countries can work with each other, so they can deploy teams, including animal organizations, to other places, and on the international level, when the disasters are so big that may require additional assistance. Now, specialties are specialties. We can call people in from some places, but locally, you know, it's easier to reduce our climate footprint by asking better responders or quicker responders from local region. So that's my call to action. Here's my uh, summary, my conclusion. Championing animal disaster law, law is not just an ethical thing that we should do, but really it builds a more resilient community that cares about all lives. So we need to do this. Um, and many countries are showing progress in doing this. We definitely can all do better, um, but in doing so, we will create a better, safer world. Um, short footnote here again, um, what happens when we don't? Um, we have seen concerns when animals are not taken care of in disasters and unfortunately their carcass floats down river and becomes a hazard to um, the reservoir. So to future um, water usage, um, we see this in many other places, disease, diseases spring up. So this is the one health component that's a public health concern. So by including animals, we can reduce all of this, saving more lives, maintaining sanitary conditions and building a stronger response. So don't forget that it's not just all of these components, but really also eventually helps recovery and then into better livelihoods, right? Um, and the more we do in prepar preparation, um, typically it results in less cost in the response because people know what's going on and they know what they're doing. So with that, I thank you everyone for listening to me speak for the last half an hour. Um, thank you so much. And um, I turn the presentation back. Dr. Z, thank you so much. So and you're much. welcome to leave your screen up there for people to copy down the information. Um, we did have one question in our Q&A. Do you think that it is important to create an international and intercontinental educational platform for disaster training and sharing experiences and rescue techniques? And how could that be created? How could that be hosted? Do you have any thoughts? Sure, actually, I'm gonna just pause that so I can respond to these great questions. So um, international, intercontinental education platform, possibly as a basis, but it needs to be implemented on a regional basis based on what the regional hazards are. Um, and they share amongst themselves. So what we're, um, it doesn't always translate like for one standard internationally based on economics and everything else, um, equipment, the training. So it needs to be adaptive. That's something I've learned um, starting in the North American system and then moving around the world um, and working in different systems, realizing it doesn't always apply in the same way um, based on economics and other things. Some criteria can be, um, and currently I know that there's um, in the US, there is a, there was a old standard um, that we subscribe to um, created by a colleague of mine, um, NARSC at NARSC. And then um, in Europe, there's current discussions on what that should be. 
Um, there's a lot of players with different experiences, components. Um, the current training out there for technical animal rescue exists. The question is, does it uh, mesh well with the other systems? Um, here's a challenge. People don't like to be told what to do. Um, people like to share their experiences to come up with a solution. We have seen, I have seen many different solutions um, from locals here across Europe. Um, even a town apart in the same country may have a different solution um, to a very similar problem. All those solutions are credible. They just need to be evaluated to make sure animals are healthy and safe um, and that it, we are not causing more injury than um, we intend. Um, the different, I would say that maybe different regional systems could come together um, and, and have a platform, but maybe on a regional basis, it might be more um, reasonable than just a purely international. I do remember that um, there was a Tech 3 uh, Sartec 3 level animal um, animal response disaster training, technical training that was being offered at one point. Um, however, it was taken up mostly by North Americans, but not really by the Europeans nor by the Asians um, or Africans. So very, very different. Does an app or online platform exist to allow for first responders and trained official volunteers to obtain health assistance in real time so that a placement group can be deployed and the answer is um, no. It really depends, Elaine, on which country because each incident command is national and it depends on what their priorities are. So they will replace um, their responder teams, be it a task force or a strike team, and they will manage those on a, um, at that level. Um, should one be created? I don't know if one should be. Oh, sorry. Um, it's just um, oh, the question disappeared. Um, I think that it is simply um, on the basis of each government. It, it seems to be a regional, uh, as you mentioned, NARSC in North America. Those organizations do work with each other and coordinate teams um, and relief teams coming in on a rotational basis during a disaster. So unfortunately, Dr. Z, we are going to have to end our session. Um, we could just visit with you. you for hours and thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Thank you so much. And I would echo um, Dr. Paolo uh, De La Villa. Um, WOA does have a wonderful um, platform on animal welfare um, for disasters, and they create a lot of work there. So please have a look there too. Thanks everyone. Thank Wonderful. you for having me.